Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Swan, the senior pastor here at Salem, and we welcome you. Welcome those who are joining us online. Well, who's ready for Thanksgiving this week? Okay, who is traveling for Thanksgiving, going out of town for Thanksgiving? Who's staying home and cooking Thanksgiving? Who's doing both? Who's doing? I'm, I'm one of those who's doing both. My mom and dad are elderly, and I am actually leaving out this week and going to cook them Thanksgiving dinner in their home and uh, find that a blessing. Anybody have a favorite, a favorite dish that they have for Thanksgiving? We have this cranberry salad that we make every single year. It takes two days to make. Two days, because you have to soak it in sugar. That's how good it is, you know? <laughs> And so uh, my dad always says, did you make the cranberry salad? Yes, dad, I, I made the cranberry salad. So we pray for the people this week. You know, one of the things that I discovered about myself or remembered about myself during the pandemic was that I cannot cook without a stick of butter. And so as I remembered that this morning as I was putting this dress on, so... <laughs> A stick of butter. I bought my butter to go cook, so we're good. So we pray for travel mercies for those who are uh, traveling. We pray for sanity, for safety, for people who are frying turkeys, all of that kind of stuff. And um, so we pray with me this morning. Holy and loving God, wash over us your spirit. May we be met by you. We give thanks and praise for you, O oh God, for all the ways that you work in our lives. Touch my heart and my mind, my soul my mouth, my lips, my tongue, God, that I might proclaim your good news, your joy. Help me to get out of the way, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we finish a sermon series today, a sermon series entitled Social Faith. And this series was formed off out of the general rules of the United Methodist Church. And we sometimes refer to these rules as the three simple rules, but I don't think there's anything simple about them. So if you know them, will you join me in saying these three simple rules? They are do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. Good church. That was really good. Well, John Wesley, he was the founder of the Methodist Church, believed that all faith was social faith, that we cannot live in a silo, that we cannot live without community, and that what we believe, we learn to live that belief together. And so this was the way we can love God and love others by doing no harm, doing good, and staying in love with God. And the third, staying in love with God is our focus for today. You know, I'm not sure why John Wesley put this rule third, because I believe that if you do not have this rule, you're not able to do the other two. So in my mind, stay in love with God really is the first rule in order to be able to live out, do no harm, and do good. The Apostle Paul talks about this being built up in Christ, rooted in Christ, in, when he talks to the church in Colossae in his letter there. So I'm going to read for you chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. So live in Christ Jesus the Lord in the same way as you received him. Be rooted and built up in him. Be established in faith and overflow with thanksgiving, just as you were taught. Now, when I say rooted, we must be rooted in Christ. What image comes to your mind? What do you think of? I think of a tree and the roots on a, on a tree they are part of the tree that brings nourishment, that brings life. And without roots, a tree will die. Roots absorb and transport water and minerals from the soil to the rest of the tree. This is especially important during those winter months, those colder months, as we are seeing the leaves fall off the trees out here. We're seeing them go into their dormant state. And this storage by the roots is how the tree sur survives. Because of the roots, the tree doesn't go hungry and gets the nutrients it needs to continue to grow and stay alive. But roots also anchor the portion of the tree above the ground. So roots are why a tree doesn't go flying off when a storm or a gust of wind comes. The stronger the root system, the harder it will be for the tree to be uprooted. 
Paul says we are to be rooted in Christ. So we're taking this image. We are to be rooted in Christ. In other words, rooted in the ways of Christ. Rooted in love and mercy and forgiveness. Grace. So when the storms come in our lives, we won't be uprooted. We won't fly off the handle. We won't be moved or shaken. In Christ, we are rooted in loving our neighbors as ourselves. Rooted in welcoming the stranger. Rooted in feeding the poor and healing the sick in sharing good news and offering hope. Rooted in the love that offers love to the unlovable. Without roots, we will fall. Without roots, we will not have the nourishment we need to continue this life journey of faith. Well, if we continue this metaphor, how do we stay rooted in Christ? How do we stay there? Roots on a tree must have good soil and water to survive. What do we need to continue to survive in our faith, to be nourished in our faith? A tree cannot live without the roots, and roots cannot survive without the necessary elements that bring life. What are the elements that we need in order to stay in love with Christ? Think for a moment of the people in your life that you love. If you're with them here, turn toward them and say, I love you. All right? Online, if you're with someone, say, I love you to them. There are some feelings that come over your, your heart and your mind and your soul, right, when you think about those people. How do you stay in love with these people? How do you stay in love with your spouse, your children, your friends, your extended family? I would guess that most of you thought, well, you spend some time with them. You spend some time talking. You spend some time enjoying each other's company, sharing joy and laughter and sometimes even tears and sorrow. Communication is the key to any good relationship, amen? We have to talk to each other. But we communicate in more ways than just verbally, right? We spend intentional time with someone, and that says, I love you better than any words can at times. Joe and I try our best to have a date night uh, at least once a week. With our busy schedules, sometimes we, we sometimes miss it, but we try to spend most evenings together. My daughters and I spend an intentional time um, often spending just the three of us, and now I make that a top priority in my life. How do we stay rooted and nourished up, built up, as Paul says, in Christ? We look to Christ in the ways that he stayed nourished, that he stayed rooted in the Father. He would spend intentional time. Jesus showed us the way, and he showed us the importance of being with the Father. Now, if you have your Bible with you today, you can pull that out. If you don't, if you have an app that you have your Bible on, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 14, if you want. And a couple places I want you to highlight. There is a pattern here in the 14th chapter of Matthew that kind of shows us how Jesus modeled this for us. Now, this is right after Jesus has heard that John the Baptist has been beheaded, and he is obviously grieving. And so this is in the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. So what does he do? He goes away and he spends some intentional time with God. When the crowds learned this, they followed him on the foot. They followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed the sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, this is an isolated place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the village and buy food for themselves. So this is the story of Jesus multiplying the, the bread and the fish, right? the loaves and the fish. 
He says, there's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. And they said, we have nothing here except five loaves or bread and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to come. And they were filled and there were baskets left over. How did this begin? How did this begin? He was in a deserted place spending intentional time with God. If we continue on, verse 22 Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowd. When he sent them away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. Evening came and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. And very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. How did this begin? He was in a quiet place, spending some intentional time with God. You see the pattern here? Before every miracle, Jesus pulled himself away and practiced the presence of God. Spent time with God, intentional time with God prayed, talked, probably cried, maybe even screamed at God. We don't know, but we know that he spent intentional time. One of the saints and heroes of our faith was a man by the name of Nicholas Herman. You maybe not know that name. You might know this name. He, he later was known as Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence. His story begins as a middle-aged, injured soldier who found himself staring at a tree one day. He noticed the leaves were stripped bare from the winter months and reflected upon his own feelings, that he was feeling stripped bare too, wondering when was the last time he felt close to God. As he looked at that tree, it looked dead, but he remembered that the roots grew deep. And then when the, sun, and when the spring came, it would come back to life. And in this experience, he had an overwhelming sense of hope. In 1651, he joined a monastery in Paris and changed his name to Brother Lawrence. And spent the rest of his life there doing menial jobs in the kitchen and mending sandals along the way for the other men in the monastery. And in these places and in these moments, he learned lessons of living a life of hope and worship and thanksgiving. He practiced the presence of God in the everyday ordinary, staying in love with God. Practice the presence. Brother Lawrence once said this, There is not in the world a way of life more sweet nor more delightful than continual converse with God. Constantly talking to God. Being with God. In the everyday. How often do we do that? Walking along, we think of something that happens in our lives and we bring God into the mix of that. Something happens that disrupts the day and we say a small prayer or a short prayer. No prayer small. How many times do we bring God into the mix of our everyday life? Taking time to stay in love with God is what Jesus taught and modeled for his disciples and models for us. And it is what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, practiced and taught all those who would join this movement called Methodism. Wesley's methods included what he called essentials, or ordinances. These were spiritual practices such as worship, prayer, communion, baptism, personal and family scripture reading, and small groups for Bible study, prayer, and mutual support. These spiritual practices, Wesley believed, were vital for followers of Jesus Christ to stay in love with God. And to be empowered by God's spirit to keep growing the movement of changing the world. You know, that's what we're called to, right? 
We're called to change the world as those who follow Jesus Christ. And the only way we can change the world is to stay connected to God. Wesley also suggested that in addition to these essentials, each of us discover ways and practices that nurture us and keep us in love with God. When's the last time you felt close to God? Identify it in your mind, in your heart. When was the last time you felt close to God? I made a phone call this last week to a member of our congregation who has been going through a difficult time. I wanted to call and check on him. And when he answered the phone, I could hear a little uptick in his voice. And I said, well, hey, how are you doing? And he said, well, I'm out here in upstate New York, and I'm hunting. And I said, you're out with God. And he said, exactly. I'm spending some time out in nature in the woods, and I'm talking to God. We talked a little bit more about how that always renews him. And... um, how this is so essential in his life. You see, you don't have to be in a sanctuary or a worship space to practice the presence of God. You can be in the kitchen. You can be in the woods. You can be out running, ride your bike. Sometimes these moments and these places, I sometimes call them thin places, where the barrier between God is so thin are the ways that we are exactly what we need to stay in love with God. Finding those times and those places. Olympic athlete Eric Little, Liddell, I'm sorry, Liddell, it's running. He says it's running for him, that thin place. He once said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. For King David, he felt close to God when he looked up at the night sky. We hear this in Psalm 8. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet. Maybe you're like me, and it's the roar of an ocean. As the waves kind of crash in and putting my toes in the sand. I always have some wonderful conversations along a beach. Maybe you feel close to God when you're serving God giving of your time in a homeless shelter or a food pantry. Bishop Reuben Job, who wrote the book Three Simple Rules, says this, And while staying in love with God involves prayer, worship, study, and the Lord's Supper, it also involves feeding the lambs, tending the sheep, and providing for the needs of others. Feeding the lambs and tending the sheep are the signs of love that we exchange with God. And they are the signs of the love that the world can understand. Disciplines not only include practices that bind us to God every day, but they also include actions that heal the pain, injustice, and inequality in the world. It is impossible to stay in love with God and not desire to see God's goodness and grace shared with the entire world. Amen? It's impossible to stay in love with God and not want something better for God's people. These three simple rules is what John Wesley said we need to live by. And I think let's let's reverse them for just a moment. I'm going to say it this way. Stay in love with God so that you can do no harm, so that you can do good in the world around us. The prophet Micah told us this way of living long before John Wesley did. He said, what the Lord requires from you is to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. Practicing the presence of God, it brings the nourishment we need to stay rooted and built up in Christ so that we can do good 
so that we can change the world from the inside out, one person at a time, so that we can respond to the world's injustices, so that we can embrace our neighbor and faithful love and walk humbly with God in word and deed and action. What are the places? When are the times that you feel close to God? This week, on this Thanksgiving week, find them. Find the places, find the time so that you and God can have a conversation. So that you and God can connect in a way that will offer grateful praise. I pray you will practice the presence of God so that you can be renewed and you too can have an overwhelming sense of hope. And this is my prayer for you, that God will pour his love upon you so that you so will be filled that it will overflow from you. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, On this Thanksgiving week, help us to remember that you are with us every breath, every step. May we offer our prayers, offer our thanksgiving. May we carve away some time this week so that we might be quiet. That we might find that place with you, that time with you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And all of God's children said, amen.